Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Same-sex marriage legislation moves forward and gaps in the state's workforce are identified. We detail in Capital Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Barkey. The House and Senate passed same-sex marriage legislation out of committees in each body. Okay. Hundreds lined the hall outside of Room 15 at the Capitol, taking time out of their day to support their opinions on the issue. My church is one that believes in inclusivity and unconditional love, um, and we hope, and we've been wanting to for a long time, legalize, have legal marriages in our church. It's part of our religious freedom to be able to um, have the state recognize the ceremonies that we do in our church. Um, but also I have good friends and family, good colleagues, um, and good fellow Minnesotans that really want to be acknowledged to have their, their marriages and their love affirmed in the state. Um, and it's part of, part of who I am as a native Minnesotan. After the election, I was very disappointed that the amendment didn't pass. And so this was not the direction, I didn't assume now that that meant that we were in favor of having gay marriage. It's my feeling that marriage is between a man, one man and one woman. And so I thought just, I better speak up because I don't know if anybody else is speaking up. The one committee stop for the bill in the Senate was in judiciary with testimony lasting nearly three hours. We come today as a family with dreams that one day soon Minnesota will grant Jake the freedom to marry. We want for Jacob what has been so precious to us the last 40 years. We want Jacob to have the joy of a wedding. We want him to have the firm foundation a marriage brings to a family. And we want this societal support that comes with marriage. I loved both of my mother figures with all my heart, um, but I have to be honest, it hurt me a great deal not to have a father figure in the home. Um, and after having a long life to reflect upon that, I have to conclude that you cannot replace a mother with a father, you can't replace a father with a mother. And so it's difficult for me, I'm placed in a conflict mm -hmm. of conscience because as the son of a lesbian who spent a long time in a love relationship with the woman, I know that some kind of legal protection would have helped women like my mother. But at the same time, I also was the child who had to deal with all of the fissures and all of the tensions that resulted from missing one biological parent. This is about family. David Patton handed this photo to me uh, after he concluded his testimony. Um, this is his son. These are his dad, his dad's. Look at what you see here. Beautiful child, but as importantly, beautiful, loving grandpas. I would caution those who are opposed to this bill to use uh, language that's dismissive, diminutive of families. The bill passed judiciary on a five to three vote, but it did not result in a smooth transition to the Senate floor. Some members of the GOP moved to reject the committee report. What we're doing by adopting the report that's before us is that we are adopting same-sex marriage in Minnesota. And I would like to just point out that this is a remarkable set of circumstances given that the majority has made statements over and over and over again that this session is about the budget, it's about the economy, that that's the priority that we have this year, and yet here we are about to adopt same-sex marriage before we even have a budget finalized by the governor, a proposal, and before the budget bills by the majority have even been introduced into this body that we are going to take a vote here today on whether or not we should have same-sex marriage introduced in Minnesota. Senator Hamm, I hesitate to split hairs, but when the sentence reads, the bill be amended and so amended the bill to pass, 
is in the uh, subjunctive mode and not in the declarative. And so this is not a vote on the bill. Minnesota has the third highest average higher education debt in the country, according to a report by Project on Student Debt. This group of lawmakers and students is asking the legislature to help them avoid overwhelming student loans. Because of the amount of debt we saw at Morris, an idea for a debt yearbook was created a few years back in order to show the varying degrees of debt and the various types of people who have debt. Looking through the yearbook, you will see that the debt is present across all majors, students from all communities, and all walks of life. Debt does not discriminate. It plagues almost every student in Minnesota. I am the youngest of three daughters in my family and have not yet started my college education, and my parents have already incurred over $40,000 in college debt. This is an enormous burden for my family to bear, and it is only getting bigger. My family is in the fortunate position of being able to take on this debt. However, I can say the same is not true for many of my peers, whom are choosing to forego a higher education for employment straight out of high school. Student loans are now over $1 trillion that are owed to federal agencies, and we have a problem in that within two years, about 10% of the students are defaulting on their loans. They can't pay those loans, and at the same time, <coughs> excuse me, um, buy homes and do the other things that's so important as you, you move into adulthood. Chair of the Senate Higher Ed and Workforce Development Committee, Terry Bonoff, joins me now to talk about her legislation and where she sees government's role in trying to develop a world-class workforce. Senator, thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me on. I want to begin with just kind of talking broadly about, I was noticing online that most of the bills that you're offering this session, or a significant number anyway, are kind of geared towards higher ed and you have legislation that aims to help Minnesota educate a world-class workforce in your words. Now, in your opinion, I want to begin with, do you think the higher ed system in Minnesota is failing right now? I wouldn't say that, Julie. I think the world is changing and is changing so rapidly that the demands for success are very different today. And so because of that, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to step back analyze where we are today, where we think we need to be five years down the road, ten years down the road, and then make sure we put policies in place that are going to get us there. What are some of the areas specifically that you think need strengthening or tightening as you start Well, just as an example, as we come through this recession and we look at areas for growth, one of them is manufacturing. This is a resurgence in our country and we're very lucky that in Minnesota we have an opportunity to lead in that way. We've got, um, in my community where I represent in Plymouth, there's a biochemical uh, alley, so to speak. We've got Bio Amber is there. We've got several companies that are new and emerging in this industry and yet the programs that our post-secondary institutions have offered aren't leaving people trained and ready to work in these new industries and so that's where the disconnect comes it's that they're new and then we have to say how do we make sure the workforce is ready to fulfill the opportunities that these provide and taking that and kind of going a little bit deeper there was recently a study done by the Department of Employment and Economic Development on hiring difficulties and it found that the most difficult to jo jobs to fill were in production as you mentioned and engineering came in second so what role if any do you think the legislature has in trying to fill these positions and train the workforce well First of all, with regard to the engineering part, the University of Minnesota is making great strides in graduating students in that area and expanding their ability to serve more students in that area. So I think you'll see some catch up. But again, is that the broadest definition of engineering or is it to fill particular sex? And that's where policy that we pass can make a difference. We had a bill up in committee yesterday that directed the commissioner to work with uh, the Department of Labor to do a market survey and analyze what are the needs and then come back and work with Minskew and our, our colleges and universities to say are there programs meeting those needs. So it's a workforce analysis, it's looking at um, demand, it's looking at shortages and then being a clearinghouse 
for the groups to come together and make sure we address the data we discover. And you have sent a file 899 and it addresses That's the one that I was issue. talking yeah, about. Yeah, so let's yeah. go a little bit deeper on that as well and, and where you see well, this so legislation taking higher that end. That part I just spoke about, the mm -hmm. labor reporting, which is a critical piece, but there was another piece that actually um, is a piece that I think fulfills the needs at an earlier level, and that is there's an amendment on that bill that requires our workforce centers to work with our school districts so that they can, the professional job counseling folks can go into our high schools, talk to high school students about the job potential, about interests, really examine where they best fit in terms of their post-secondary, what their career opportunities would be, and augmenting the role of a counselor. So that is very exciting and something that is something we have not really tackled before. And let's move on to the maybe the financial aspects of higher ed. Okay. It's, it's obviously been a big issue with the expense incurred by students right now. It's an issue in committee. Mm -hmm. How do you think the governor's budget recommendations of you know, $240 million in additional higher ed funding, will that make much of an impact in drawing some of the costs down? Well, I think it's a piece. You know, the governor proposed a third, a third, a third, uh, $80 million for Minsku, $80 million for the University of Minnesota, and then $80 million for higher well, student grants and an additional 10 for the um, Office of Higher Education. And so the University of Minnesota has said if they get that funding, they will freeze tuition. Minsku has said if they get that funding, it will uh, help with the workforce issues, but they're still going to raise tuition you know, by 3%. I think we aren't doing enough to change the trajectory around cost. And so we've been focusing in our committee around MOOCs the massive online uh, course offerings that is kind of a, a new revolution. I think you'll be seeing more and more of that. But I think when colleges and universities have the opportunity to blend these new online activities with the traditional, you'll begin to see the costs come down. But I think we as policymakers need to ask our institutions to bring those costs down and we cannot keep the student debt um, trajectory the way it is. And so, Senator, in your opinion, do you think Minnesota higher ed students are going to benefit from the work that's done this and next session? I this? do. I really do. I think that um, we've raised a level of consciousness around these issues. We've put a, a flashlight right on the student debt issue, the rising costs. We've asked the University of Minnesota to come forward with a plan to lower their overall administrative cost burden. The, um, President Kaler was in yesterday to review their first uh, report on that, and now they're going to tackle it in a much broader way. So I feel like in a short time, it's just been two months, that um, we've made great strides they are going to pay off for us in the future. And do you think those strides are going to pay off with our workforce as well, and quickly enough to fill some of these vacancies? Well, that's always the challenge, isn't it? How do you respond immediately to a problem that's pressing? And um, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful in that Already we're um, seeing apprenticeships come forward. There's Bueller, another company in my district, has an apprenticeship program with Dunwoody whereby they have five students they took right from high schools and they're paying for them to go to Dunwoody, work in their company, and they'll have jobs afterwards. So that's one example that, and we're spreading the word about that so that other companies can follow suit because that's a wonderful way to get young people trained. Okay, Senate Chair of the Workforce Development and Higher Ed Committee, Terry Bonoff, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Governor Mark Dayton released his modified budget proposal following a budget forecast last February that showed a smaller state deficit. The broad tax reform which I had proposed lacks the public and legislative support to be enacted. Thus, as I disclosed last week, I am discarding the extension of the state sales tax to business-to-business -to -business services. My principle of tax fairness then leads me to eliminate extending the sales tax to any consumer purchases. I now propose that no change be made to Minnesota's existing sales tax structure, including no taxation of either purchased services or clothes by families, individuals, or businesses. But we would continue to ask the affiliate nexus or the e-fairness be changed so that those companies who are selling out of state into Minnesota who have people selling on their behalf in the state of Minnesota would have to collect a sales tax. So we would add that affiliate nexus uh, to the corporate reform area as well. 
the sales tax, again, I'll leave it to the Department of Revenue, but their suits index, the sales tax is, is still mildly regressive. So if you focus on the sales tax, you're having the effect of raising the relative tax burden on, on the middle class. And that's exactly the opposite of what I want to do. I believe the middle class is overtaxed and the upper class is undertaxed. And, and my, my way of approaching it is a better way to accomplish the revenue increases necessary to offset, offset the deficit and make the investments I want in education and economic development. And I just think it's a better way to approach it. We're just uh, willing to be here to help and offer solutions that we think do work, which is uh, the direction our budget took two years ago where we said let's offer some restraint, try to live within the means that the people of Minnesota have offered to the government, and try to restrain the spending growth to within the growth of the uh, economy. We think that works. That has generated revenue. Uh, we think that's the direction with the people of the state of Minnesota, not additional tax burdens on the economy, and let's make sure if we're going to spend money we get real reform and effective spending and effective results. Senator Dave Thompson joins me now to give his perspective on what he thinks the legislature can and shouldn't do to help with job creation. Senator, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's begin with that question. Seeing a lot of the legislation that's coming through committees and seeing the governor's early budget proposal, what do you like, what don't you like? How do you think the legislature can intervene in helping job creation, if you even think that's its role? Well, I think the primary thing that the, the government can do, that being, of course, uh, the political branches of government, the executive, the governor, and the legislature, is really to create a competitive environment that encourages job growth through thriving businesses and a thriving economy. As we have seen over the last couple of years, as we controlled the growth of government, and tried to, to hold the line on taxes, we've seen economic growth. And that has resulted in additional money coming into the Treasury. And uh, whenever that happens and the economy is growing, employees benefit, families benefit, and those that, that run companies benefit. So creating that competitive environment and making Minnesota a good place to work and a good place to employ people is the key. And where do you, where does higher education fall in this formula of a competitive environment, in your opinion? Well, higher education is critical, obviously, uh, and we've got some of the greatest uh, higher education institutions in the country, right here in the state of Minnesota. And so we we clearly want to encourage people to become educated. And you know, we've got a lot of high tech industry in this state. We've got Medtronic, Boston Scientific, and many other companies. I shouldn't name them because then I leave some important ones out. But just for example, and so obviously we need an educated workforce that can fill the jobs at all levels that those folks need. There was a study done from the Department of Employment and Economic Development called a Hiring Difficulties Survey, and it found that the most difficult jobs to fill here in Minnesota were in the areas of production, manufacturing, and engineering. So do you think that as studies are done like this, that it's the legislature's role to parlay legislation or to create bills and, and help fill these gaps, or do you think this is a, a market issue? It's clearly, in my view, a market issue. Um, and one of the things that, that frustrates me as, as policymakers is the old saying that to those who have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And we sh at the legislature and the governor should not try to solve every economic problem. Now, where frustration sets in is markets respond slowly. In other words, there's a demand and it takes a while for supply to catch up. If all of a sudden there's a, a relative shortage of engineers, a relative shortage of manufacturing people, then wages will go up in those areas and those jobs will become more attractive. But obviously it, it, it's, it's uh, children, people coming through high school that make the decisions to respond to those incentives and it takes a while to get up to speed. But as uh, Western Europe has proved, and Eastern Europe before it, the model of having government try to, to dictate where people go to move the economy forward is not successful. What is successful is allowing people to make decisions based upon market signals, and I assure you that if the, uh, if the salaries and benefits for engineers go up 20 and 30 and 40 percent because of a, uh, a high demand relative to supply, more students will start going into engineering. What do you think of ideas like the governor's proposing an additional $30 million to the Minnesota Investment Fund? hoping that that will bring in some new jobs, um, new companies. Do you, do you like that concept? Well, not really. And, and the reason that I don't, I don't know that that proposal in and of itself is so bad, but I'm just a believer that market signals should determine people's economic behavior. And so when we try to artificially, you know, it's, it's the same thing when we try to create incentive 
to put capital where there's not a return on investment. I immediately think of the ethanol experiment. It's a failure because if ethanol was a good energy source, you wouldn't have to subsidize it. People would invest capital in it. Same thing here. If we have uh, areas uh, in the job market that uh, there's insufficient supply, eventually people will correct that because the market signal will be salaries and benefits and other things are up. So no, I don't believe the government should be in the business of dictating those kinds of things. I want to get back to higher ed just for a moment. And what do you think the government's role, the legislature in particular, should it have a role in reducing the tuition costs for students? Or again, is that kind of a market issue? Well, no, that isn't a pure market issue because of course public universities are not profit driven and it's not a market transaction. Ironically, and you may not have heard this from many people, my belief is the continued subsidy of higher education actually drives the price up. Um, I mean, think about it. One of the, the largest contributors to money into the system is, is the, public, uh, the public expenditures. And those things are tending to drive costs in higher education, I believe. Now, um, do we want to hold tuition down to a point where it's reasonable? Yes, we certainly do. But, you know, nobody has ever answered this question for me from a university. And that is, how has the cost of university education spiraled so out of control since 30, 35 years ago when I was getting educated? Why is that? What has caused that? Nobody can answer that question. I hear things like, well, technology is expensive. Wait a minute. In business, you don't adopt technology unless it can save you money. Uh, and besides that, even if it is a contributor, there's no way that it could contribute to the extent that we're seeing higher education costs skyrocketing. So is there a problem with the cost of higher education? I would argue that there is, but I don't think the answer is feeding more and more government money into the system. It is asking why has this happened and what do we do to resolve it? So I'm going to put you on the steering wheel for a minute here, Senator, and if you could craft legislation that could create a strong workforce, a growing workforce, a world-class workforce, as Senator Bonoff puts it, how would you craft it? Well, I, I mean, my belief is that the best thing that we can do is get out of the way. And, um, you know, we've, I've heard my political opponents many times say that, oh, you know, businesses don't respond primarily to taxes and regulations. Obviously, there are many factors. One of the reasons Minnesota continues to be successful is because we do have a highly educated workforce. We've got uh, some sociological factors going for us that help. Um, but the fact of the matter is that creating a, a business-friendly environment causes companies to move here, expand here, stay here. And you know, you've, you've got to do that in order to, to grow good jobs. As Senator Han has said, I'll give him the credit, you can't be pro-egg uh, pro and anti-chicken. It doesn't work. And so if we want good jobs, good eggs, we've got to have good chickens, good employers. And so we need to create an environment in which it makes sense to run a business in Minnesota. I think we're going to leave it with those words. Senator Dave Thompson, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. Thank you. We continue our conversations with new members by sitting down with Senator Eric Pratt. We had this discussion with him shortly after he was elected. Senator, you work in risk management in the banking industry. You have an MBA from the University of St. Thomas, a member of the Prior Lake Savage School Board. How do you plan to use these experiences in your new role here with the State Senate? Well, throughout my career and even on the board, uh, one of the important aspects, one of the important skills I've had to work on is is trying to influence people and often trying to influence them without authority. Um, I work a lot with peers at the bank, uh, certainly being on a nonpartisan board with uh, six other directors, we had to work together as a team to uh, come up with uh, uh, results um, and to meet the needs of the community and the expectations of the community. So I hope to bring that uh, to the legislature and, and work not only with my colleagues in, in, in my caucus, but uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle as well. Yeah, and I did notice on your webpage that you really emphasize that ability to work with the entire school board on some contentious issues. So, you know, given the reaction of Minnesotans to the gridlock a couple of years ago here at the Capitol, do you see your role, even as a freshman legislator, as kind of a facilitator of um, bringing, bringing people together? I do. It's it's what's expected. Um, people didn't elect me to be a freshman senator. They elected me to be a senator, and I'm going to do the best that I can uh, and try to be as influential as I can, uh, not only within my caucus, but within my committees. Um, we didn't always agree on the school board. 
um, but and and oftentimes we had split votes. Um, that's just our belief, our perspective. It was it wasn't based on any sort of of mandated ideology. It was just the way we believe. And I would never ask anybody to vote against their principles, and I would never vote against mine. Okay, I want to ask you something else from your website. You state, I believe Minnesota should flatten the tax code and expand the tax base. Obviously, mm -hmm. taxes will be watched closely this coming session. So if you could create tax reform, how mm -hmm. would you craft it? Well, um, I'm, a, I'm a believer in the flat tax, um, where everybody pays the same rate. Uh, I know there's a lot of people who believe in a consumption tax, but uh, uh, I tend to favor more of the flat tax for a couple of reasons. One, uh, consumption tax tends to be more regressive than an income tax. Uh, also, two, uh, you, you tax what you don't want. And I think we need to create an environment where uh, commerce is free to flow. And I don't want the government in the way of that. And you stated earlier that you were elected as a senator, not a freshman senator. So will you come to the table with these ideas? Or are you intending to just kind of sit back and see how things unfold? No, I intend to, I intend to push my ideas as, as, uh, as best I can. Um, not all of them will be accepted. I, you know, no is never a final answer. A lot of times no just means not now and you continue to work on them over time. Property taxes have been on the rise for more than a decade and you point to your work on your website as well on helping reduce property taxes in your area. So what's going to need to happen in your opinion at the legislative level to reverse the trend of rising property taxes? Boy, that's a, that's a tough question because uh, when you look at the residential taxes, we're about in the middle uh, of the country. We're high on business property taxes. And I'm hearing from small business owners that that's really an impediment to their growth. Um, I had one businessman tell me that he has to pay uh, his, pro his business property taxes before he pays uh, himself, before he buys new inventory, before he expands his business, before he hires another person. Um, and we're among the top. In, uh, or the highest in, in, in business property tax. What we did in Prior Lake Savage was we got rid of our debt and that was a big uh, uh, help to us to be able to lower property tax rates for our, for our residents. Okay, what made you decide to take a run for the Minnesota Senate? <laughs> um, there were a number of, of, of things. I've always had a desire to serve. That's why I served on, on the local board. Um, you know, Senator Rob Claire Roebling was a, a, a terrific leader for us for, for many, many years. And when she decided to retire, um, I looked at the ability to be able to uh, uh, take the skills that I have and, and, and bring them here um, to continue maybe uh, her legacy in a way, but maybe to bring some, some fresh ideas and some fresh energy to the, to the legislature as well. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. That wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching this week's Capitol Report.